Hello everyone. Uh, today we are joining with Ignacio uh, for the second session of introducing the HEAL project ourselves and our work. Um, so join us for this session. Going to let folks come in and Ignacio will be joining us very shortly. Welcome everyone. Okay, did it. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> I feel really technically savvy every time I can just get on an IG live. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that. <laughs> We're going to get better at it. Uh, we, this is the second, second session, especially in IG live. We're doing to um, introduce ourselves more, go into the work we do at the Heal Project. Um, last time we talked uh, about who we are, how did we get into this work? You can find that video on our IGTV page. It's also on YouTube. Uh, and uh, yeah, today we were thinking about uh, introducing our uh, mission statement and talking more about, uh, you know, why did we, how did we even come up with that mission statement uh, and the different elements of it uh, that are so important to us. And we try to always do our work around um, the elements. So. I'll I'll say our mission statement and then I'll pass it to Ignacio to speak about it. Yeah. Uh, so our mission is to prevent and end childhood sexual abuse through healing the wounds of sexual oppression and embracing sexual liberation. There's a lot in there, right? <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, when I was thinking about, you know, how we break down this mission and statement and talk about, like, what, what's behind the, the passion and the work that we do. Uh, and so I want to, like, extract sexual oppression. You know, like, let's talk about what sexual oppression is. Because I think a lot of times we use these big words and a lot of people have an idea or a sense of what that is. But I think that we have a very kind of limited idea of what sexual oppression is, which actually um, uh, feeds into who is a survivor, who isn't a survivor, who's a monster, who is this and who's that. So um, what is uh, sexual oppression, this really big thing? Um, and I think a lot of times we talk about it in um, breaking it up, you know, into the four eyes. I'm sure people have heard of this many times, you know, like how we think about um, sexual oppression or how it has manifested. Um, through um, ideological, you know, I ideology, ideas, an idea that sparks about a particular thing, and then how we, um, how that it's uh, taken into institutions and create policies, laws, and ideas, and the culture of institutions. And then because of the culture of the institution and the laws and the policies, it gives reason uh, and um, validation for people to treat others in a particular way. And so that sexual oppression is going back and forth be between community members and society. And then it gets to a point where because it's the idea that is floating around, because the institutions support it, because people are treating you the way they're treating you, then it doesn't really take much uh, for you to like seep that shit into your own body and then project that out into your children, your own family, um, and how you raise your kids, how you... Uh, relate to others. So that's just uh, the tipping point, uh, maybe a broad stroke of sexual oppression. We can get more into like the nitty gritty of that. Yeah, I mean, I'd say let's get into the nitty gritty of it, right? Because um, my own idea of what sexual oppression is has shifted um, growing up. Uh, you know, I, I, I mentioned before I grew up in Iran and then um, I came here when I was 18. So I've been here all of my adult life. Mm -hmm. I started having sex and being sexual in this country but a lot of my ideas around what sex was and what sexual connections were formed, um, you know, in Iran. So, like I was saying to you earlier, uh, you know, to me, sexual oppression, so I was very aware that I was living in a country uh, that was sexually oppressed. Uh, and I think most uh, people who, I, I'm generalizing, I think most people who live in 
non-Western countries have this idea that they're sexually oppressed, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that's perpetuated also. Most people who live in Western countries think that everybody in non-Western countries is sexually oppressed. So, and then what that is, like to me, it was, oh, like we can't, uh, you know, uh, we have to, as, as a grown up, as a woman uh, at, a, at that time, as a girl, as a young girl, um, we had to cover up, right? We have to be modest, we have to cover our skin. We had to uh, monitor the way that uh, we interacted with, in public, interacted with men. And then uh, on a more general level, people couldn't have premarital sex. And, and those were the extent of what I understood as sexual oppression. And, uh, and then I came here and, I don't think most people here think that they're living in a sexually oppressed, right? unless you are some, someone who is like involved in the sexuality world, maybe kink world, mm -hmm. you probably don't think you're sexually oppressed and you think you're sexually oppressed. Sexual oppression is for people who grew up in countries like mine, where they can't have perimeter sex and women have to cover themselves. So <laughs> <laughs> that's why I'm saying let's get into the nitty gritty of it and what is it? Well, I, when you say that, of course, it brings up the, the little um, gif, I think, that I saw a while ago. It's been out, out for a while, and I'm sure people have seen it. And it's a, like this picture or something of a uh, woman in a hijab, right? And she's covered from head to toe, and all you see is her eyes. And then on the other end of that, there is a white woman, um, skinny, two-piece bathing suit, right? And they're they're commenting on each other. So in the bubble is basically, they're both saying poor, poor, like poor woman, like she is so oppressed and like she doesn't even know it. And so we were talking about this and it's like, yes, it's both true. <laughs> it's yes and, right? That it's not so simple and that the way we think about sexual oppression is this like, everything is put into this cookie cutter model. Sex is put into a cookie, cookie cutter model. Gender is everything, right? So even sexual oppression. So this is what sexual oppression looks like. This makes you a victim or survivor. If you don't fit into this, then you're not a part of that, right? Which also makes it very difficult. It makes it difficult when we have those little cookie cutters because then we feel like um, we don't fit. We're not worthy. We can't talk about that thing. It allows us or it, it propels us, you know, not to uh, engage or talk. And interestingly enough, you know, in terms of like the, uh, the four eyes, talking about like institutional and stuff, you know, how people say, you know, in other places in the world, it's just so horrible for women. I mean, it's the, it's the thing that people talk about the most, you know, it's just like poor women, um, you know, they have to cover up and all this stuff. And it's interesting because that's exactly what happens here, but it just happens in a different way, right? We have maybe the, the ramifications are a tiny bit different, maybe not, <laughs> but at the same time, like in here in you know, North America, uh, we have um, society shaming, you know, and, um, you know, throwaway culture, right? Because if, again, if you don't fit or if, if uh, if uh, you don't fit the narrative of, we talk about men all the time, right? Um, can a man be sexually oppressed? You know, uh, can a man be a, a victim or a survivor, right? The answer is yes, but in this current system and in the current, uh, the, uh, currently because of patriarchy, of course, that it, it absolutely affects, you know, cis women, femmes, uh, you know, girls, women, uh, and it also affects uh, men. And um, bigger than that, you know, it's interesting. It's like bigger than that, it affects the world and how we function, right? And how we even heal, right? So how can we heal from something that we don't know that we're healing from? So we have to identify oppression in order to begin the healing process, right? Yeah, exactly. And that's, I think, goes back to the idea of, right, like we talk about sexual liberation as body liberation. So sexual oppression then becomes body oppression to me in, in many ways, right? Um, and the wounds of that, the wounds of body oppression is like the, like the idea that, for example, our genitals are dirty. Uh, not only just physically dirty, like they are full of germs and disease, but also that dirty is like something to be shameful about, something private, right? Like something, uh, I, I, by private, I don't, I'm not saying we'll flash in public, but uh, mm -hmm. what I'm saying is like something that you have to 
uh, protect at any cost because if yeah. it is right like, and, and, and then there's so much shame and fear that comes out of that notion right like the whole idea of like revenge porn right uh, why is revenge porn so so powerful why is that so powerful like it's it even there was a whole thing with like jeff bezos uh i don't remember that or not a couple of mm -hmm. months ago uh so it's, we're talking about jeff bezos, bezos like the richest man in the world mm -hmm. the biggest mm -hmm. asset of the world most the most powerful person and um, there was a, like a scandal he had with, you know, this mistress of his. And uh, I believe like some, somebody had, uh, was blackmailing him uh, to show a dick pic of his publicly if he wasn't going to send like this money or do this thing. Mm -hmm. And it was all over the news. And then finally, Jeff Bezos like write a thing saying that, you know, if I can be blackmailed, over it's basically revenge porn right it's like do this thing i want you or i will release a picture of your penis mm -hmm. and it's like if he was like if i can be blackmailed if I, if I don't say anything if i go along with this if i'm like then who, who's gonna speak up who has any anything to say and it's just like this the the reality of you know the how sexual oppression shows up in every day mm -hmm. it, like this ever present thing that we live through our body oppression that our bodies are, in, are under constant attack from ourselves, from those around us, from media, and yeah. from incidents. Yeah, yeah. Um, it makes me think, because when we first started this conversation, we're like, what is sexual oppression? I was like, oh, sexual oppression is when, you know, when I was a little girl walking down the street, knowing that at every corner, some guy was trying to touch me or grab me or do something, right? Sexual oppression is the fear that when the elevator was broken in my building and I had to go down the stairs and I was terrified somebody was going to grab me and take me to the roof, right? Sexual oppression is that I knew that my body was just accessible to anybody who wanted to touch it, right? Um, sexual oppression is that I did not know anything about sex uh, at all, really, until I was much older. I thought I had an idea of sex, but really that was skewed by, you know, uh, my uh, sexual abuse. Right. And so sexual oppression is like not having this information, not uh, not it's it's everything that's happened with reproductive rights. Right. Everything that uh, people have been working and fighting for, for birth control, <laughs> for all of those things, not having that was sexual oppression. The continued fight for the the right to choose, you know, choice and abortion, that is sexual oppression. The sterilization of women, uh, poor women, people of color, and uh, people with disabilities, women with disabilities, that's sexual oppression. I mean, it, the list goes on and on, but we don't see those as sexual oppression. I think we chalk them up as like, this is just the way life is. You know, men are like this, women are like that. We accept it. And that's just not true. <laughs> Women are not like this, and men are not just like this, and we do not just accept these things, right? We have to challenge uh, these things, because sexual oppression uh, lives all around us every single day, like every single day. Yeah, definitely. And, and uh, like you're saying, so much of the conversation around sexual oppression has been focused on women um, globally. It is something that has been focused on, you know, there's an element of racism to it is that sexual yeah. oppression is for non-white people um mm -hmm. and really like when you look at it i really want to talk about the sexual oppression of, of men as well right like the whole, like you're saying the whole notion that men's sexuality is this uncontrollable thing that needs to be tamed uh or that's uh, that men's sexuality is just what it is it is just this yeah. stuff written out of control thing that um you know, we just have to figure out, the rest of us have to figure out how to navigate around. Mm -hmm. That no amount of education, no amount of like, possibly teaching young boys and men how to, right. um, you know, access their own bodies, their own sexualities, will not remedy the problem. Or even on the other side, sexual oppression is the good men that I see being afraid of their own sexuality. They exactly. feel like they should never ever express sexual interest of any kind in anything. Mm -hmm. Because if they do so, or if they even fantasize about, you know, sexual fantasies that are not very, like, limited, then they are bad men. To me, that's sexual oppression. It's like, what, what are the possibilities we're allowing ourselves, yeah. all of us, men, women, non-binary people, of thinking about our bodies, the possibilities of our bodies, the possibilities of pleasure, and possibilities of bodily autonomy.
right? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so like I, I also want to touch on with that view, how do we see sexual oppression connecting to CSA then? Why is it that sexual oppression as or healing the wounds of sexual oppression right. as the step that we need to take in order to prevent and end CSA. Yeah, I mean, healing the wounds of sexual oppression. When I think about you know sexual oppression, and I think the mo the 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 uh, the most horrific, <laughs> the just the most horrific um, thing that can happen is the sexual assault of a child. I'm, I, you know, no one can argue with me about that. That's the way I feel because that child has nothing, no, no idea of anything is innocent, innocent, just completely, you know, and for the power of an adult to just completely destroy trust, caring, everything, everything. Um, we, we live in a society that says children are our future, but we don't give a shit about children. We really don't because if we know that child rape, uh, CSA, uh, rape in general, is a product, is, is a mechanism of war, is a mechanism of control, is a mechanism that is used over and over all over the world, that little boys and girls are being raped and, and, and uh, is sexually abused every single day, that if we actually accept it, that that is happening for real, and that we also accept it, that children are actually important and that we need to provide safety, care, information, all that for them, then we would actually, um, you know, embrace, I would say, embrace that um, sexual liberation is about um, teaching them, about um, talking about it. And not just talking about this is what your body parts are. We've got, we, we gotta go above and beyond that, okay? We are, we've been talking this lingo for 30 years about body parts. Yes, that is great. That is absolutely important. First step, let's do 201 and 301 and 401 of how to keep our children safe. So this, when, when Arendi and I talk about this, it's about the, the systemic, right? Because we're stuck in the interpersonal stuff, which is great, which needs to happen but we need to talk about systems. So uh, embracing sexual liberation, even when you just said, which is funny, the visual, um, sexual oppression is seen as a, a POC thing, right? People of color are sexually oppressed or women are sexually oppressed. And then on the other side, when we see images of sexual liberation, what do we see? We see white people, right? Um, why is the idea of sexual liberation seen as white, privileged, right, um, and not a right for everyone, right? So there, that big discrepancy, the discrep like when we talk about who is being affected by, you know, sexual assault, everyone, yes, and who are the most, <laughs> uh, those pushed to the margins, and who does that tend to be? Black girls, black women, you know, children with disabilities, right? all of the kids pushed to the margins, right? And so if we know these facts, you know, like even when we see survivorship, survivorship, this is when we learn, I think, when we talk about the healing part. I think this is where we began. We gotta heal survivors so they could understand and get to the sexually liberated place. But when we started doing that, we realized, oh, this fucking work has to start way back because what they had in common was talking about their youth, about not knowing shit about people not talking about anything. And if they were trans, they were alone. They could not talk about their trans body or they, how they felt about themselves. Um, uh, because of all of the oppression, sexual and just oppression, racism, you know, white supremacy, all of that, um, it, it compounds that. And so the, the, in thinking about like what sexual oppression is, I think we have to like break that open. It can't be the white people in the fucking woods having, you know, orgies and stuff. That's a piece of it. Yes, that's beautiful. But it can also mean, you know, um, black people loving their black fucking bodies and having sex, fat people having beautiful sex and saying my body is beautiful, right? Like the uh, ways that we can embrace ourselves because all of the oppression has like, it just cuts us down, right? It's like, um, you don't fit, you don't fit. You're ugly, you're fat, you're black, you're this, you're that, you're a child. So you know, only a little bit of people get this information or we figure it out our own. So 
sexual liberation goes beyond me saying, oh, I'm polyamorous. Oh, I'm kinky. Oh, I have many lovers. Yeah, that could be a fun thing. Sexual liberation for me goes way beyond the, the, the fucking. It, to me, sexual liberation is, is here. It's, it's, what, it's what we learn. It's how we relate to one another. It's how we love our own bodies and understand who we are um, and how we can stay connected to people. Um, so I can, I can talk about sexual liberation all day, every day, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, th for sure. And that's what it is, right? Because um, like thinking about uh, child sexual abuse, I see so much of the conversation traditionally, like so many of the organizations working on this issue, uh, all the focus is on, you know, there are a few sick people who for different reasons, they just are weirdos, freaks, you know, sick people. They have this like sexual interest in children and they just can't help themselves. They're going around assaulting children. And that couldn't be like further from the truth, right? It's like of what, when we look at why CSA is happening, where CSA is happening. It's like, it is by those that you know and those who look the most normal. Right. And it's so, like, what is this culture of sexual oppression we've created that is, that is making predators, that mm -hmm. is creating predators? What are the conversations we are having uh, in our families, in our communities about sex, sexuality, sexual desire, fantasy, reality, the difference between mm -hmm. them, offending, not offending? It right. is none of that conversation is being had because CSA, you know, right now, what are we talking about around CSA? It's just like, be vigilant if you're a parent, if you're a caregiver, be as vigilant as you, uh, you know, can around the strangers, the guy in the park, right. your child online, or like the weirdo in the community who's like introverted and doesn't talk to anyone. Right. Make sure your child doesn't go near them and then cue it on. Mm -hmm. That's it. Like this yeah. is the conversation around CSA we're having. And meanwhile, we see that over 90% of cases of CSA happening domestically by yeah. you know, family members, friends of family, and older children. Um, so it's like, what is the disconnect here? Mm -hmm. Why are we not talking about the fact? Because if, if we actually allow talking about sexuality beyond, well, you know, pedophiles, All right. you know? That's it. CSA is because of pedophiles. If we just could figure out, if we just lock all the pedophiles up, we'll solve the problem of CSA. Yeah. But, well, I wish that was the answer. I yeah. wish that could work because we've been doing that shit for a long time yeah. and it's not working. No, no. <laughs> right? not at all. And you know, what I keep thinking is that it goes, it just keeps going back to power, power, power for me, right? Because it's like, um, when we when we historically talk about you know sexual assault rape and stuff we say it's about power and control power and control it's not about sex i remember back in the day it was like it is not about sex it was big arguments about that right and i understood why that argument came about then because we were really trying to understand rape and and um them people twisting it around to like uh, make it seem like the person wanted it that it was consensual that all this stuff right and so we uh, when when we think about, but lost my train of thought, what was I saying? Power and control and understanding. Yes, power and control, <laughs> right. So on one end, um, we're saying this is the thing. It is about power and control. This is why people rape. This is why people sexually assault and all that. And then on the other hand, <laughs> we're still dealing with uh, power and control because parents don't tell, their, talk to their kids, or if they do, they're really not equipped to talk about the things that they need to in depth, right? Um, that this goes beyond the way that we craft um, sex in this society. It, it is put in a nice little Disney-like romance bubble, right? It's heteronormative and it is solely based on, you know, like one day you will fall in love, you will find your mate and you will get married. And it's like the, the sole purpose is um, in our life, right? It's like work and partnership. Right. That's what we do. We get it. We, we learn. We get try to become better people so that we can get a good job, make good money, meet that partner. And boom, we've, we've made it the American dream. Right. And so um, what we do is uh, we completely fuck it all. We completely fuck it all by doing that, because uh, what we do again is, again, regurgitation of that fucking thing that we do. It's like we've already had a preset idea of uh, this child, this life, right? And we think that by not sharing these things, we, we, we think that by um, um, uh, 
creating this um, romanticizing of relationships that people that, that the weight right because this is all about fear this is education through fear i'm going to scare you uh, because i'm scared right because i don't want you to get pregnant i don't want you to be a slut in the world i want you to have a good job i want you to have, live a good life right this is what parents say when kids come out as gay right it's like Mm, you know, I have gay friends, but you know, I just don't want you to have a horrible life be gay. So just don't be gay, right? <laughs> because it's about just taking care, right? Because you just want the best for them. But if in fact, we wanted the best for our children, if you really think about it, then we would be setting up our kids from day one on how to find, uh, understand, maintain and nourish relationships, healthy relationships. And people say, well, how is sexual liberation connected to healthy relationships? <laughs> okay, so first off, you have a fucking healthy relationship with yourself, right? Because you understand your body. You understand, uh, we talked about being a child, right? That, that time when you're a kid and you realize that you actually have a fucking body, right? That you are so like, holy crap, right? And you get to ex uh, explore your body, how beautiful that is. We want to get to that place about like, uh, getting to understanding our own body, our own existence outside of our family of origin, this idea of heteronormativity, outside of all of these fucked up ideas that are just prescribed for us, right? And so if we set them up with, you know, learning how to communicate, um, uh, how to listen to people, really, how to um, give critique without being an asshole, how to give an apology, how to be empathetic, right? These are all fucking serious tools to actually live a normal, healthy, beautiful life, right? That can help us, right? And if we can't do those things because of uh, accessibility or disability, that we have much more language to talk about how we can express ourselves in a variety of ways, right? Like we find the ways, we, we find the ways to meet the person's need. That's the other way, not the other way, right? We're pushing everybody to this one thing that doesn't fucking work so it's like we don't set our kids up we actually set everyone up for this journey of trial and error of, of figuring out who am i what do i want what do i desire what am i into so it's like most people come out later on in life because all they ever had was this one little thing and then once they what go off to college or something they're like oh this is another life right so it, it's more it's more than the 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 sexy sex stuff which is great but it really is um this intelligence this maturity this um this intentionality around how we relate to one another and i keep using the word relate because i also bring it back to how we relate to mother earth our earth because we're horrible we fuck our mother all day long and we and then uh, in talking about children and stuff it, to me it's not separated it's just not separated how we relate how do we relate to the earth that's supposed to like take care of us right like water all this does we fuck her and we just figure it's gonna be okay later on same thing the kids later on it'll work itself out no, not the way to go. <laughs> right, yeah, and, and that's what you're saying is also like the way we talk about sexual liberation, right, in the conversation around preventing and ending child sexual abuse. That is something that um, it's not touched like that because uh, the whole idea of, like you're saying, because child sexual abuse is not seen as having to do anything with sex. I mean, sexual abuse in general nothing to do with sex mm -hmm. and then child sexual abuse even less to do with sex right and then here we are talking about well actually it is a culture of how we understand sex sexuality body and relationships mm -hmm. right that is creating sexual violence yes. right like that is just so like power and control is one part of this but why is it that let's say power control is a, even a big part of this why is it that someone who's trying to assert power and control is choosing sex as the vehicle? Exactly. Why? What is the what is the what is it about sex and sexual uh, relationships and connections mm -hmm. that is motivating someone who wants to exert power and control to choose that? Right. Right. What is their understanding? Why are we creating so many people whose relationship with sex is harmful? It's like I'm going to go harm others yeah. because that's yeah. how I'm going to express my sexuality. Mm -hmm. Right. Like we need to be thinking about this deeper. What what happened to that person? 
What was their childhood like? What messages did they receive about their own body that they think harming others sexually is the way for them to be, right? right? Um, and, and yeah, just the idea of sexual liberation and children in one sentence, it freaks people out. Yeah. It, is, it is something nobody wants to think about because all we can think about around sex is either this loving, you know, love-filled thing we do with this one person we found who's going to like be there for us through everything yeah. and every moment for the rest of our life or sexual violence. Yeah. That is it, right? Mm -hmm. There's the, the two conversations around sex and we don't think either of them is relevant to children or there is this fear that if we tell them anything else is out there, they're going to want to get up and yeah. do it tomorrow. They're going to go up and be like, I'm going to have sex with everybody. Yeah, which is totally not true. I think uh, I feel very strongly that the more information uh, young people have, they're less likely to actually go out and do stuff. And uh, yeah, my daughter is one of those. She talks about that very openly. I was like sex educator extraordinaire, having all types of stuff in my house, talking about sex nonstop. My daughter didn't have sex until she was 20 something. Right. She had all the information. She was the one talking to other people about using condoms and this and that. And, you know, um, because I was just giving her information. So I, I think it was like a thing like, I don't got to rush, you know, because I was telling her the truth about it, the absolute truth about sex and relationships and all of that, because that's what I wanted to know. I felt so confused as a kid. I didn't know what the hell was going on around me. And I was really trying to figure it out. You know, um, especially when my body started changing. That's like the worst, the worst, I think, for little girls. And I think it's also the worst for boys because we don't think about it in that side. I've been, I recently read the book Men Too. It's a really intense read. It really, really is. And it really talks about the sexual uh, abuse of, of men, like CSA uh, survivors, in a way that you would uh, think that, this was like uh, uh, something that just happens over here, but it's actually uh, quite, um, it qu happens quite often. But the difference, this is how, this is how the gender binary and patriarchy continues to fuck us, right? Because the difference is that we have been trained to notice, uh, sometimes, not all the time, but we have been trained to notice um, women as survivors, right? Maybe if she's withdrawn, uh, you know, not, um, having good relationships or ha having horrible relationships, right? Or on the other end, someone who is highly oversexual. The first thing we start thinking about is like, what the hell's wrong with her? And then we start thinking, oh, what, what's going on? You got, then that's when people start, you got daddy issues, you got this, right? We have a whole set of ideas around the expression of emotion and sexuality of women, right? But when it comes to men, um, I feel that the ways in which men express their um, hurt, anger, um, <clears throat> trauma, of course, is going to be different because we actually live in a gender binary world, right? That um, if they behave differently, then it would be shitty, right? So we don't, re we don't remember or realize that because boys, uh, I think what happens is they are experiencing sexual assault and sexual violence just as much, but it's not... Um, categorized as it like it's almost like uh, you did that you had sex with that person and it's it's like really cheered on and i heard in this book there's you know some of the men were talking about like i just went with it because i thought that was the way it was supposed to be right how many times have women said i went with it because i thought it was supposed to be it's the same fucking story but the expression is different so we have boys joining gangs you know like fucking um being rageful right you know because they don't have words to fucking talk about the thing or they're having like mad sex with everybody or they're not right and sometimes the ones we really notice are the ones that are in the corner nobody's you know like talking to and stuff and maybe just maybe but they have to be expressing it just the right way to get help oh that broken little boy but if it's a fucking guy screaming and crying and pounding his fist let it be a black man that's a dangerous individual, right? And so that's how systems continue to just keep us in those things. So that man will never be a, a, a victim or a survivor. And because of that can actually perpetuate or propel bad behavior, right? And just, or, or uh, behavior that is not good for us, right? And we all do it. 
as trans, non-binary, cis women and men, but it's just accepted differently. It's very seen very, very differently. I, I love the way you're putting this because it really is starting to like, you know, thinking about what sexual violence is, right? Because I feel like there's this notion a lot of us have around sexual violence being like, did someone touch me? Did someone force themselves on me? Mm -hmm. And especially like, if they were a stranger, the better, that's more of a legit sexual violence. Um, right. And that's it, right? It's like, so like, yeah. even think about our childhoods and we're like, well, nobody technically like touched me in, you know, mm -hmm. private areas. So I guess I haven't experienced sexual violence. Right. Um, right. But really, like, when I look at just myself, like, I'm, I'm one of those cases. I don't have any memories of anybody physically touching me. But what I do have memories of is enormous amount of messages that I would receive on a daily basis about my body, mm -hmm. about my sex, my sexuality, about uh, how I was re about, supposed to be relating to my body, right? Like, like especially like during puberty, um, I didn't know what masturbation was, but I was masturbating. I was confused about it. I thought I was gonna die because I didn't know what it was. It was confusing. I was really yeah. depressed because of it. So like, and then all these fears of being violated, right? It's like, so like, yeah. we understand that, for example, in the context of racial violence, there is now this awareness that racial violence, is not just the person who gets killed by the cop. It's everybody else, right, being subject to the violence and the fear of these things happening to them and not just being killed by the cops. It's like yeah. all the interactions, all the things you have to go through on a daily basis living mm -hmm. in a white supremacist culture. That's right. all racial violence, right? It's like we live in a culture that nobody, no non-white person is free from racial violence. So once we understand that, then looking at that from a sexual violence perspective right. is like, all of us are subject to sexual violence. It doesn't matter if you were literally physically touched by someone or someone forced themselves on you. Yeah. You are receiving all these violent messages, all these violent interactions around your body, mm -hmm. around your sexuality, your sex, your relation and stuff, romance, you know, friendships. All of that to me is right. sexual violence. Yeah. Right, that, that that we need to have the awareness of, and that and that's where it becomes the point you talk about that CSA is the problem for everyone, right? It's like the way we understand sexual violence happens to all children, and we are the adults who were once children experiencing that, and yeah. now all of us are trying to figure this out together. A lot of us are having children of our own, and we are just going to cycle this thing through. Mm -hmm. And when we when we talk about, so we're talking about family and, you know, like um, in society, families in society, but we also can talk about this in the larger context when we talk about how CSA prevention or ending CSA should and must be a part of every movement, right? Um, and we make the case, you know, like uh, one of the toughest ones that people get to think of is like, let's think about climate change. How is climate change connected to the, um, the, the prevention and ending of uh, child sexual abuse, right? And so here's one good example, and I know there's many, but uh, here's just one good one. Um, when there are natural disasters or catastrophes, we know that sexual violence, sexual assault, even child abductions rise, right? We know this. It is an absolute <laughs> um, when this chaos happens, right? And so if we actually lived in the world that understood that sexual violence was as horrific as it was and it has the ramifications for the rest of our life as it does, and that it truly, truly believes in the safety and the rights of children, then we would actually have a protocol in place for when natural disasters happen. Uh, for children, right? Because, or, um, because we know that they are most, they're most at risk, right? Um, because we know that families get separated, right? We know that this is the, the best time when chaos is happening. So why don't we have protocol in place, right? When, if we know that abduction and rape and stuff is a product of war, like I think that there are many ways. And I, keep, I, I really keep thinking about, this is not happening in, on, in North America, but I keep thinking about the, the the black girls, the African girls that were taken from the fucking village, what, 300 and something black girls and stuff, and how, <laughs> how we just didn't give a fuck. And, you know, those girls, a lot of them didn't come back. I started watching the documentary of that. Mm -hmm. I could not, I, I have, I, I, it's, it's like horrific. And then their even existence of understanding that this is a possibility just for going to school, 
these black girls and that that they're so disposable you know mm -hmm. that they can take 300 and something black girls and use that as as leverage for whatever they want it all right like this just this happens everywhere and we and you know we can talk about trafficking that people think happens somewhere else that happens right here right here we have a very skewed idea of what sexual oppression is and sexual liberation is uh, and i think this is this is the core of the the work it's like really thinking about um how to broaden this idea and so people could understand exactly what that sexual oppression is the breadth of it and then actually understanding sexual liberation as the tool the mechanism the thing that will that will help us all really because it, it when it comes down to it it really comes down to understanding ourselves, our bodies, our minds, who we are in the world, and how we relate, care for, love, and respect others. Right? That's that's like sounds so simple, right? <laughs> <laughs> so simple. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Ignacio. Uh, I thank you everyone who joined us for the live session. We will have this video on our YouTube channel uh, as well as IGTV later with subtitles. Uh, please feel free to send us your questions. We will be incorporating that into the future videos we're going to make uh, to introduce ourselves and our work uh, on Instagram. So we look forward to hearing from you. We just talked about a lot of things. So I know these concepts, um, each one of them can be quite a, a bunch to talk about. And we will have more of these conversations. Uh, so yeah, thanks again for joining us. And uh, hope you have a great Friday. Thank you, everyone. Have a good weekend.